On July 19, 1977, the world teacher, the Christ Maitreya, head of the spiritual hierarchy, emerged from his ancient retreat and is now in the modern world. With his disciples, the masters of the wisdom, he will inaugurate the new age of synthesis and brotherhood. Good morning and welcome to our World Teacher Programme on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM presented by Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. In today's programme we'll be featuring articles on education in the new age. We'll begin with extracts from Benjamin Krem's book The Great Approach followed by a transcript from an interview with Mr. Krem's master by Patricia Pichon and ending with an article by Carol Joy. Benjamin Krem states that the great new spiritual energies in great potencies are pouring into the world on a daily basis. This is transforming human consciousness, including the consciousness of young people. Young people are sensitive. They feel themselves to be souls in incarnation. And yet everything they experience in their family, in school and in the streets seems to be totally materialistic. It is against the very nature of the soul. The soul is oneness, wholeness, seeing humanity as one. But the child goes to school to compete with other children, to be the best, the very opposite of the nature of the soul. Schools are not there to prepare children for life. They are there to prepare children for business. Business has taken over all life. That is why children don't want to go to school. It's called commercialization. Education and healthcare are run as if they were businesses. They are not businesses, but services, absolutely essential to evolving human beings. Today, most education, for what it's worth, is education for jobs. People are simply fitted to make their living in the outer commercial world under the whip of competition. This will change. Competition has to give way to cooperation. Above all, it is competition which is based on greed and fear that holds humanity back in its most important expression of its oneness, its sense of being part of one group. This has to change. When it does, people will realize and the masters will exemplify the fact of the soul. Then the education for the life of the soul and the psychology of the soul will become more and more the norm in our educational system. There is probably no perfect education anywhere today. Everyone has a more or less limiting and in some cases crippling education which thwarts their creative imagination, inhibits them as individuals and builds fear complexes, fear of teachers, fear of exams, fear of each other. It also overstimulates harmful competition. A school teacher is trained to teach children to read, write, do arithmetic and so on. It is a very limited range of ideas which a teacher is called upon to evoke from the pupil. In most cases it is not even that. It's a limited set of ideas which the teacher is instructed to teach the child by rote to adhere to and accept. That, to my mind, is not education at all. Education should be the evocation of the potential, whether emotional, mental or spiritual, of each individual child. I would say that education in the first place has to show the child that it is a member of a world family. The synthesizing energy of Aquarius must be used to create this global consciousness. Children need to be shown that we are not living alone in one large or small country, but in a world shared by 5.7 billion people. The child, above all, should be taught that this is the fundamental position of his, her life on earth, that they are one of a group, a family. 
just as a family shares the resources that comes into the household, so the human family should share the resources that are given by divine providence for that purpose. Also, each child needs to be recognised as being unique, with a personal race structure that is the outcome of their past incarnational experience and the sole purpose in this life, because the soul provides the rays for the various bodies. Therefore, real education and the education of the future must necessarily take into account the ray structure so that each individual's education can be tailored to fit that person. That concludes Benjamin Krem's comments. As a side note, here's an explanation of what is meant by the rays. According to the Masters, seven types of energy sweep through our solar system. They affect every atom within it and are referred to as the seven rays. Man, considered as a personality with physical, emotional and mental bodies and as a soul, responds to and is coloured by a particular combination of these rays, depending on the individual concerned. At each level, physical, emotional, mental, personality and soul, a particular ray predominates and the effects are expressed via particular strengths and weaknesses. Now we'll read an extract from an interview with Mr. Krem's master by Patricia Pichon, who begins by asking, In many cities around the world, education is in crisis, particularly in the West. The authority of both teachers and parents seems to be declining, and the problem of discipline in the classroom is a major one. What, in your view, are the causes and what are the remedies? The master replies, the problem is not one of discipline. It is a question of freedom and a new sense of the validity of the child, his need and right for self-expression. Each child at whatever level comes into the world with his or her own set of purposes. A main one is to learn to live in peace and harmony with all others and in right relationship with his own environment. The possibility for this to take place is very rare. So great are the inequalities of opportunity and educational standards that few find themselves in a situation where their true worth and needs can be respected and served. The world today is saturated with a new spiritual energy, the energy of equilibrium, focused by Maitreya. It drives everyone in two directions inwards to his source, which gives a person an added and often powerful sense of himself as a unique individual, and also outwards to society, where he seeks to stake his claim. The problem of discipline is connected with this crisis in the psychology of the child, and with the need to recognise all young people as unique sons of God, evolving towards the manifestation of that sonship. All educational establishments today, without exception, are in a state of transition. Some more, some less. It will take a considerable time for the necessary adjustments in educational theory and practice to take place before the problem of discipline can be solved. The young everywhere need and are demanding their freedom and the right to be treated not as subservient imbibers of pre-digested knowledge but as adventurers seeking the answers to their questions and the fulfilment of their dreams. Ms. Pichon then asks, In Japan there is an intensely competitive atmosphere in education. Children in Japanese society study long hours and many go to extra classes after school, returning home quite late to do their homework. What is your view of this trend? The master replies, this problem is not confined to Japan, but has reached its acme there. As a result of the commercialization of learning, vast numbers of children are being subjected to these injurious conditions. The results will show as the present generation reaches maturity. However, people everywhere are amazingly resilient and quickly replenish their reserves when invited to do so. This will happen in Japan in the not-too-distant future, and increasingly elsewhere. 
a new dimension, the dimension of the soul, will become more and more accepted as the basis for the child's need. When this has become the case, each child will be seen as an evolving soul moving towards the fulfilment of his or her potential for this given life. The new science, the psychology of the soul, will be the basis of all future educational efforts and will transform life for both the child and the teacher. Schools and colleges will lose their institutional aspects and integrate more and more with the society in which the child is found. A closer relationship, therefore, between school and work will become the norm and open the way for schools without walls. Miss Peachon then says, Recently, an article on education in The Independent, a London newspaper, described the creation of several unusual schools in Harlem, a well-known black neighbourhood in New York. One is a marine science school, another emphasises the arts, a third has a strong business orientation, and so on. The academic results of children emerging from such schools have soared, which seems to prove that even in neighbourhoods riddled with severe social problems, the creative potential of many children is there to be tapped. Are these schools the beginning of experiments in the direction you are describing? Yes, these are the first signs of the new awareness of multiple experience, wide-ranging action and interests, rather than the narrow specialisation predominant at present. Each child brings to life the sum of his or her many achievements in the past, and much is lost to the world of talent and gifts when the opportunity for their expression goes unprovided. Out of these many experiments, much will be learned of the true needs and inner capacities of the child, which today are severely underrated. This is the source of much of the indiscipline and lawlessness which abounds. Do you mean by this that education will become individually tailored? Precisely. Each child is unique and the education must reflect that individual need. With the new science will come an understanding of the rays. When the individual rays of children are known, their gifts and limitations can be better assessed. The role of the teacher, therefore, will change profoundly. Each teacher will become a mentor. What, in your view, are the immediate aims of education? What are the first steps in laying a more appropriate foundation? The first step is to accept the autonomy of the child. Each child requires education, otherwise he cannot fulfil his potential. However, that education must fit him as you would require a pair of shoes to do, and as the shoes become outgrown and must be changed, so too must the educational structures, outlook, curricula and concepts respond to the child's changing needs. Basically, there are two educational structures in many countries, one for a small elite, preparing them for the higher echelons of influence and power, and another for a broadly based egalitarian remnant, which is equipped for the lesser posts in industry and other fields. Each has advantages and disadvantages, but takes no account of the variety of gifts and levels of evolution to be found among children everywhere. The truly gifted child must find the environment to fulfil his gifts. This is relatively rare today. The broad mass of children produce a less sustained level of achievement but must feel that all resources are at their disposal. It is of course true that the truly gifted child will achieve eventually under most conditions, but much valuable time is lost for many for want of the necessary stimulus at high level. This is an essential requirement if the needs of the new time are to be met. You're listening to the World Teacher Programme on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM.
Carol Joy wrote this next article on education, based on quotes sourced from the Alice Bailey book Problems of Humanity. She begins by saying, The word education has a Latin root, educare, meaning to draw out what is already waiting to be released into expression. The world teacher returns to draw out of humanity its inherent divinity and release ever greater dimensions of this divinity into all fields of human endeavour. As we lay the foundation for education in the new age, we can do no better than to keep before us the model set by Maitreya and the Masters and construct a global educational framework to nurture into full flowering the love, the intelligence and the will to good which naturally resides in every human spirit. In the 1940s, the Tibetan master Joel Kul dictated a series of papers addressing the esoteric significance and aims of education. Although the readers to whom his ideas were presented in 1947 were of a very different culture from ours today, the educational situation, its problems and solutions, will sound familiar to the current educator. Most education in the past, he said, has been primarily competitive, nationalistic and, therefore, separative. He went on to show how education has treated material values as primary and helped foster materialism. It has cultivated a false sense of superiority about the student's own group and nation. It has ignored the obligations of world citizenship. In fact, said the Master DK, there are two basic principles which should govern all education and which, when applied, would automatically eliminate many errors made by past educational endeavours. These are the value of the individual and the fact of the one humanity. All children, he points out, have certain assets and should be taught how to use them. These they share with the whole of humanity, irrespective of race or nationality. Today the fact of the one humanity is real, in a way it could not have been for most of the post-war generation. And this advice can now be fully absorbed and implemented. Actually, we have been preparing to reconstruct our educational systems for several decades, and out of the dissatisfaction expressed by students and teachers alike, have grown reforms which are, in embryo, the educational programs of tomorrow. The more innovative educators and educational institutions are offering or calling for global education, values, clarification and more individualised instruction. To integrate the student into the community, fairly large-scale work study and apprenticeship programmes have been instituted. Some schools teach group processes, cooperative rather than competitive learning and playing, and involve students, teachers, parents and neighbours in projects to improve community life. Building on these fine beginnings, Education in the New Age can begin to fulfil its real function as the process whereby we know ourselves to be souls and permit our true nature to manifest for the good of all. However, for this to happen, certain very pervasive educational practices will need fairly rapidly to change. Curricula, textbooks, learning sequences and learning tools are all geared for an age that has passed and must be revised. And chief among the restructuring of education so much needed now is the need to attract different kinds of teachers. Education is no better than the teacher on whom the learner depends for guidance. In the future we will need to attract to this most profound of professions people whose greatest joy is to participate in the holy experience of helping a fellow human being break through the barriers of their own ignorance into the light of knowledge. Teachers who know instinctively how to bring out the best in people and when and how to prod the learner to greater and deeper learning. Teachers who practice their art with love, patience and understanding and who will substitute cooperation 
for the competition and power mongering that characterises so many educational experiences today. These teachers are not products of the academic mill, though some may well have been through standard academic training, but are teachers because they are by nature educators, in the same sense that the world teacher and the masters are educators. DK points out that a teacher learns by teaching, and there are many people in every walk of life who are already teaching all the time. Healers, artists, parents, journalists and so on, though few would call them teacher or seek their services within the educational establishment. The computer has already revolutionised society and will totally alter the face of education, stimulating tremendous creativity and skills development at the same time. The home computer centre and the community learning centres that are already springing up will take a great deal of education aimed at mental development out of the hands of the school teachers, out of the crowded classroom and place it in the hands of a new breed of educator. These electronically literate teachers working cooperatively with the students will help them to program their own studies. As today we can play whichever computer game in our living room that our funds will buy, tomorrow our children will have an ongoing dialogue with the computer and computer-oriented instructor about how to stimulate the child's learning at any given moment. We hear a great deal about educating for leisure, a leisure induced by the computer-led advance in technology. But this concept of leisure has little meaning in a society where working is not restricted to a 40-hour work week or a 40-year time span. As we approach the time when anything that improves the quality of life is considered work, the old idea of leisure time will be replaced by a more integrated lifestyle which merges the two. Educators, therefore, have the task not so much of preparing youngsters for leisure, but of preparing them for service by nurturing their inherent talents and skills and, at the same time, helping them realise the fact of their place in the one human family. Everything they will do as adults, including play, can be experienced as a learning experience, a chance to better their own past performance, an opportunity to bring happiness and joy to others. Ideally, the child and adult alike should be so filled with the urge to create and learn and serve that there is no such thing as leisure or spare time, only different kinds of time to use for everyone's advantage. And as the practices of meditation and consciousness development grow more widespread, young people will be prepared to cherish those periods when they can turn inward and commune with their souls. Certain aspects of the educational process will doubtless become common to most of the world's countries. Right human relations is the goal of all societies and, as DK points out, a global education framework must emphasise those past accomplishments, current ideas and future visions that lead to these right relations. Finally, we should remember that education, while it is but one of many societal functions, is in a certain sense the pivotal function around which all human activity revolves. To live means to learn, and there is nobody who is not in some way a learner and a teacher. Education is quintessentially a spiritual process, and our evolution itself depends upon our capacity to learn and to share what we have learned for the good of the whole. And of all the lessons presented to us in lifetime after lifetime, the one which includes and yet surpasses all the others in meaning and importance is the lesson of our own identity. This lesson is, ultimately, the one every student studies and every real educator teaches whenever the educative process takes place. In addition, it is also a subject in and of itself, and coming to know ourselves as souls is a progressive educational program that
that can actually be thought of as a graded curriculum. This curriculum will gradually come to be understood for what it is and, when implemented, will lead the learner from instinct to intellect to intuition. Thus, by the time adulthood has been reached, adult education will mean something very different from what it conveys today. It will mean a concentrated effort to complete the building of a bridge between our personal identities and that transpersonal dimension of our beings we call the higher self or soul. The future of education is the future of our progress along the path of evolution. They are one and the same. Under the guidance of the master educators for the planet, the members of the spiritual hierarchy, we will grow into our divinity more quickly than at any time in human history. Who can even imagine what lies ahead for us as we move gradually from the hall of ignorance to the hall of learning and ultimately into the hall of wisdom? And that's our program for today. If you have any questions or would like to know more about the world teacher Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom, please call us on 0636461001. That's 0636461001. Or visit the website share-international.org where you'll find more information on the various aspects of the emergence. To inquire about Share International magazine subscriptions, books by Benjamin Krem or our monthly free-of-charge newsletter, which contains extracts from the current Share International magazine, the number is 04234 That number again is 04234 or write to P.O. Box 9576 Wellington. Thank you for listening to us on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM and please tune in to our next World Teacher Programme on Saturday the 5th of August at the usual time of 10am. You can listen again to this programme and previous ones by visiting our website at share-international-nz.info and click on the radio tab. Music